So we've been talking about Mel, who's this kind of like mythical. Is he mythical? Do we no, think? No, he's a real person. So yeah, Mel, Mel was a real person in I think 1956 to 60 when uh, you know, computing was real cutting edge, and memory was at a premium. Uh, so I think he had 4,096 bytes to work with, or something like that. So uh, luxury, luxury. Yeah, every byte counted. So we did the self-modifying code and as ever on YouTube, there were some comments saying, don't tell me what to do. I'll self-modify my code if... Absolutely, but yeah. Putting that to one side, um, what, what's the next sort of chapter in the story then? Well, th this sort of brings it all together as uh, sort of a, the, the finale of the thing, which uh, is comes back to the email that uh, came around in, oh, goodness knows when, uh, early on in the internet anyway, when people were discussing these real programmers and this guy sent this story of Mel. Well, we should so, do real there, really, shouldn't the we? Real, real, yes, the real programming. So this is not what you really want to do because uh, although it works great, it's almost un unmaintainable. So the story goes that he worked on this Royal McBee computer, which um, I've never heard of before or since, but was quite popular at the time, I believe. And there was a new version of it coming out. And whenever they went to trade shows, they always... Uh, sat there in front of this computer and got people to come along and play and they, they had a, a blackjack program. So anyway, this blackjack program was really popular. So he was asked to port it to their brand new machine with this 4096 bytes of drum memory and so on. He got it all running and it was all working perfectly and it was very, very popular at shows. But then the sales people said, this is all great, but unfortunately the program beats the customers too often. <laughs> is there something we could do somehow to uh, just, just install a, um, you know, something to tip the odds in the customer's favor? And you know, th this would really help us sell a few things, you know, just create a nice atmosphere. And Mel was, no, not keen on this. That's, that's, no, that goes against all my principles for changing this and that. And Anyway, he was lent on apparently by management and by other people and so on. And, you know, we really need to do a little bit more just to just to help the sales of this thing come through. So eventually he uh, decided, OK, he would. And there was a switch on the front of the computer. It was to signal something. But anyway, he could tap into that and say, right, if this button is pressed, I'll, I'll do something. So he wrote some new code to say, if the button's pressed, then I'll, I'll stack the odds slightly. He did that, produced it and sent it out. When they tried it out, it turned out that it actually stacked the odds in the computer's favour and not, <laughs> not the customer's favour. And Mel thought this was great, apparently. He thought this was, uh, you know, this was justification that you shouldn't try and fiddle with, uh, you know, the, the, the probabilities and so on, and you should just play the real thing. So uh, he refused to fix it and actually went on to um, work somewhere else. I don't know where else he went. Anyway, after Mel had left to go to Pastures New, the guy who posted this, he was brought in by management and said, Mel did this change and unfortunately it, it uh, changed in the wrong way. Can you go and have a look at the program and just adjust it and fix it? And his, uh, his comments on that were quite a revelation. He said, you know, I knew Mel was quite a smart guy, but, you know, I looked at this program and I just couldn't really understand how it was going. I spent a couple of weeks pouring through the details. It was bringing in code. It was modifying it, changing it, putting it back, things like that. I mean, he said the absolute ultimate uh, bit was where I came across a loop that had absolutely no exit. So the code went into this loop and it just continued forever. So I'm sure you've done things like this, you know, in the early basics, you'd do, you know, 10, print, hello, 20, go to 10, run. And it would just, you know, print, hello, continuously. So he found a loop like that in the code and just couldn't explain it. Every time he ran it, it ran through the loop, exited, perfectly and he just couldn't figure out how this was happening this is one reason why self-modifying code and things like that is just so dangerous dangerous absolutely i mean when you're writing it, it it seems like oh wow you know i'm sort of on the cutting edge here i've found this great hack here that uh, can cut through things but you give it to someone else and they just can't understand it um you know without considerable amount of effort there are cases where it is useful, but usually this is sort of generated by compilers or things like that, where people sort of are letting the machine do the modifying and not, not the users directly modifying it. Anyway, this, this loop, it turned out, it was running right at the top of his available memory. And 
Although the machine had index registers where you can automatically apply an offset to something, so it's typically used for stepping through arrays, you, you say, go and read this information from this bit of memory, but add in this index register, and that will sort of move you along the memory without having to change anything else. He didn't use index registers. They, they, were, they were far beneath him. He actually read in the instruction with the address which was attached to it, and he incremented the address in memory and then would re write it back. So he, he would be changing the, the code all the time. What Mel was doing with this, he was incrementing these instructions and stepping along this array or something like that. But at one point, because it was right at the top of the memory, he would increment it and it would actually go beyond the biggest integer that would fit into this bit and actually overflow onto the next bit. So this would set the, the sort of bottom few um, uh, bits to zero and it would overflow a bit into the next bit of the instruction. And this would change the instruction, which was probably a fetch or something, into a different instruction, which happened to be a jump. So it would get to this point and what would normally be a fetch suddenly changed into a jump to location zero. And it jumped to the beginning of the program, which was where it needed to go anyway. So it would sit in this loop and then some part of it would overflow, overflow. changing the actual code. Change the code in from a, a fetch into a jump, jump to the beginning of the program and carry on as though nothing had happened. But there was no way of seeing this apart from completely pulling the whole program apart. Pulling it apart and working through exactly what was going on here. And finally, finally the light dawning that, oh, OK. I can't, you know, because if you just looked at the code, it was just fetching instructions and instructions and fetching bits of memory. And there was no, no jump out of the loop whatsoever. But, yeah, finally he managed to work out that uh, yeah, the, the critical thing was that you were not only modifying the address you were reading from, you were actually going to modify the instruction. So at this point he threw his hands up, went back to management and said, you know, there's actually no way I'm going to be able to change this program. It's just so, so intertwined. And, you know, if I do make a change here, it's all going to fall apart here. I, you know, I'm just going to leave well alone and... Uh, You'll just have to set it with the switch and the uh, customers will just have to play it on the regular blackjack setting. But the other bigger thing which uh, sort of pervades the industry now is don't try and be too clever. You know, if, if you are extremely clever, then the people that come after you who have to look after the code are going to be spend so much time understanding it that, you know, the, you might save a few milliseconds here and there, but actually you're going to waste hours and hours of programmer time trying to understand this what you're doing and, and fix it. So, you know, the, the, the moral of the story is being too clever can be, uh, be quite, quite, a, quite an issue for you later down the line. I was trying to think of a good analogy. I was kind of imagining like you're driving a car along and you can't work out why it turns corners. You shift, yeah, into third, fourth, fifth gear and the sixth gear starts to turn the wheels suddenly. <laughs> oh, I wasn't expecting that. But, uh, <laughs> Whenever I get to this bend, I've got to change gear and that'll turn the corner. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, yeah. But, Do we yeah. know what happens, whatever happened to Mel? Did he just retire? Uh, and... No, it says in the story that he went on to past his new with a few dollars uh, associated with it. So he probably got a better offer to uh, uh, go and do something else, which. Uh, and uh, he, d he does end up with saying, I wonder if, you know, Mel was ever embraced the new idea of, you know, sort of object oriented design and, uh, um, you know, uh, testing and all, all this sort of thing, or whether he was probably still twiddling bits and uh, look, looking for shorter cuts that uh, and he probably thinks that he, he he'd probably stick with the uh, the twiddling bits and uh, working close to the metal as they say yeah it seems to me like he's the sort of person who thinks in binary <laughs> oh, very much so yes remember that and in modern cpus you would have a link register of some sort that remembers didn't have that in the very early days, but boy, did it dawn on them that you needed it. Oh, so someone voted for Mike. Oh, it doesn't even let, let you vote for Mike. Yeah, so. Might be a bit of favouritism in the voting here.